Okay, let's talk about an example of a multi-reaction system. We are, of course, going to come back to steam reformation of methane because I think it's a really good illustration of um, some important concepts here. Now, uh, let's look at this reaction. We've been treating this reaction as a single uh, reaction this entire time for a month now, really. But um, when you look at this, you think, well, hang on, I've been in lab and uh, I've been around methane and I've been around steam and well, they, they don't actually do anything, mostly because when you've been in lab, you've been around room temperature. Um, but even so, it's not super obvious that this is what's going to be the likely outcome, even though it's the desirable outcome, right? Like hydrogen gas, very useful. And um, you can do a fair bit with carbon monoxide as well, even though it's poisonous. It is, in fact, um, still got some nice reactable bonds. So we can do some stuff with this. But you might think to yourself, eh, there's lots of other ways I can imagine combining methane and steam, uh, or at least the atoms that are involved in all of this. So what I want you to do, what we'd normally do if we were live in class, is I would throw this open to a brainstorming exercise. I would say, okay, take, pretend you have available to you all of the elements that you see here, which are just basically carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and write as many balanced equations as you can come up with that use these, um, especially if you can get them to start with our starting materials that are in the reactor, but um, feel free once you have created new chemical species to use those in the reactions as well. Go. So in fact, um, I invite you to do that brainstorming yourself, write a whole bunch of uh, balanced reaction. Uh, but of course, it's hard for our reaction, uh, our example to continue uh, with each of you brainstorming independently. So I brought in some help. This is Simon, who is in high school chemistry, and I pulled him in to do the brainstorming at this end. And here's what he came up with. Note that he reinvented our original reaction, just kind of sitting right around here, and then some other things of varying possibility and uh, silliness. So let's uh, go through this for just a second, and I'm going to make a few notes. So you should notice anytime you have something that generates carbon, it probably comes out as a solid, whereas every other species we have is behaving as a gas. You also notice that there are some reactions that might happen that introduce oxygen to our system. And once oxygen is introduced to our system, we have the possibility of this reaction right here. So time to hit pause while I give you another assignment. A pretty good indicator of the relative uh, frequency, or no, not so much frequency, uh, abundance, how likely a particular reaction is to completely take over all the other reactions is we uh, use the delta G for that reaction at our reaction temperature as our rule of thumb when we look over. If something is a, has a very, very large negative delta G, it is probably quite likely to occur more so than things with kind of small positive delta Gs or large positive delta Gs, certainly. So I'm gonna pick a few of these reactions for us to look at. So we're gonna look at our key reaction, um, just, uh, go look up what was our delta G. Oh, let's pick a temperature. Uh, let's say we are reacting at 800K, okay? Uh, and you can go off and use kcalc to do this, uh, figure this out. How likely is this uh, reaction? How likely is the hydrogen um, and oxygen to be generated just by water falling apart? How likely is, uh, methane to just also fall apart. This one may be tricky to work out because you've got elemental carbon in here. Uh, so be prepared to make some assumptions as you're looking at this one. And then uh, just for kicks, let's look at this one here where we have methane combining with oxygen. Pretty sure you know what happens when methane compares, uh, uh, reacts with oxygen. Uh, but go ahead and do the math. So for all of these, figure out uh, the 
relevant delta Gs, and we'll see which of these reactions uh, we think we need to worry about. So that's step one. Uh, hit pause, go off and do that right now. So let's imagine we, uh, we're going to go forward with looking at these three reactions. And I'm going to give these reactions names. I'm going to call that one. I'm going to call this one two. I'm going to call this one three. Um, and uh, let's see what we think this system would do. So reaction one is characterized by C1, reaction two by C2, and reaction three by C3. And now we're going to write, let's imagine we have uh, our reactor initially has methane and water in it, one mole each of those, and nothing at anything else. Um, now, I think you'll see that this is very important because if we have any oxygen at all around, given what you just worked out, I hope, on the last page, you see that this reaction, reaction three, completely runs away. Uh, so we have to do our best to keep oxygen out of the soup here. So now let's write expressions for the numbers of moles of every thing in this reactor. So let's say I want to write an expression for NCH4. And uh, I want you to see how that goes. So I have one initial mole of that. And now I've got, um, well, what I've always got, which is minus 1C1. And now you say, how do I incorporate these extra reactions? How I'm going to incorporate these extra reactions is I look at each of them and see what role CH4 plays and uh, stick in that C2. So uh, C2, reaction two, no impact on methane. Uh, reaction three, uh, let's see. Oh, look, there's CH4 uh, as a negative one again. So negative one, C, not four, three. Okay, so NH2O is equal to one minus one C1 um, minus two C2 and then plus two, C3. See how that works? Um, NH2 equals zero plus three, C1, plus two, C2, and then there's no C3. All right, so you have to do this in CO. You have to do this for N. O2, do this for N, CO2, then I think we've covered all of our species, right? So I ask you to uh, go forward and fill each of those out yourselves. Hit pause. Okay, I finished writing those out, and I also wrote an expression for the total number of moles, and I want to call your attention to the fact that reaction three, C doesn't show up in the total number of moles because there's three moles on the left and three moles on the right. Now I want you to see how the multi, I want you to see how the multi-reaction system complicates what we've normally computed. So let's again assume that we are in a ideal gas land. Um, and so that this, if I want to write an expression just for uh, equilibrium for the first reaction, going to be delta G just like it normally was, so that's no big deal. But where we'll see some real changes here is when we try and work out compositions. Because you recall, this will be uh, YH2 cubed, uh, plus, not plus, what the heck did the plus come from, times YCO divided by YH2O and YCH4. Okay. That's, we've written that before, that's no big deal. But now, just imagine, we're going to zoom in, for example, and what does the expression for YH2O look like? Well, that looks like NH2O divided by N total. And that is where things are very different than they've been before. So here you go, here is my expression for YH2O. And you can see, even though this is the expression for Ka for the first reaction only, right? Like, so this numerically is going to be equal to Ka for reaction one, it's still got C2 and C3 hanging around in it because uh, those 
also impact how much water we have present. And so I can't just solve this expression. It's not one equation and one unknown anymore. It's one equation with three unknowns. And so for me to figure out what's going on here, I will also need to write uh, Ka for reaction two and Ka for reaction three and solve them all simultaneously. And that is going to be a matter of ugly, but still just algebra, uh, right? Because all of these are just going to be uh, polynomial expressions in terms of C1, 2, and 3. And so uh, the best thing to do, and you can see a hint of this a little bit in how I was lining up the Cs, is uh, this is the sort of problem that MATLAB was created to solve. Uh, it is a pain in the butt, bordering on not really possible to solve this in Excel. Excel isn't built this way. Um, it takes a lot of effort on your part to solve polynomials in Excel, but uh, MATLAB, very good at this. So that's the, uh, that's the idea. Oh, the other thing that is in fact pretty good at this potentially is uh, Hysis and Aspen. Although Hysis and Aspen tend to assume that you are going to solve your react, you're going to have your reactor not run at equilibrium, uh, but uh, because you're not going to wait that long, you're going to have your reactor uh, be based more on kinetic principles uh, because you are not holding everything in the reactor long enough for equilibrium to really be a concern. So uh, in HISIS, often you uh, use experimental data to set the conversion. But anyway, this is the idea here. So I encourage you, just so that you've solidified in your head how this is set up, to set up all three of these and uh, tell me a little bit about it uh, in the quiz for today. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.